comedy and tragedy is something I think most people are familiar with, the humour and the darkness of such films as Brazil or Fargo. Here I want to talk briefly about the tragedy in comedy. Not the comedy in darkness, but the sadness that is often hinted at and sometimes used in not necessarily dark funniness. Roll the VT then. I said hands up, who likes... Rick, we heard what you said. Here I'm not talking about tragic comedies or dark comedy specifically, but rather tragic elements that make comedy sharper, or that comedy to a certain degree uses as a foil, as a way to connect with the audience, or draws its humour from. If dark comedy finds humour in the macabre, comedy and tragedy, as I'm talking about here, is sort of the opposite, the sad facet of not-dark comedy, the tiny prick of tragedy in a film or show that would never be described as such as a whole. We'd like to offer you a very generous redundancy package. Are you offering me it, or are you telling me I've got to take it? Um, we're telling you you've got to take it. That's that ruined, isn't it? That's what I was... I, was... I want to say now that a lot of this video is, really, exploratory. That's media speak for I don't exactly have a point. But don't worry, I will be scamming you throughout. Keep watching. I'm looking at the tragic element in comedy used by both the product and individuals. And I think a good place to start, where that element has been written into a non-dark comedy very carefully, is to look at Basil Fawlty. Yeah, well, there's no point in paying money to Mr O'Reilly when Mr Stubbs would have to do it for free. I'll call him now. Well, he won't be there on a Sunday, dear. Well, then I'll call him at home. <laughs> <laughs> Fawlty Towers is what might be called quintessentially British, if for no other reason than anything British is very British. Hello. I am English. Hello. Not that I think there isn't a great deal shared culturally in humour anyway, but the focus on a flawed, even dislikable main character might be called typical. Winking. It means don't trust what I just said. The series, of which there are only 12 episodes in total, follows Basil Fawlty as he barely runs his four stars on TripAdvisor Hotel. It's a sitcom. There's a bit of a slapstick, but it's mostly a very quick-paced and wordy farce. It's not a tragedy, it's a sitcom. But it relies on the tragedy of Basil Fawlty himself. Drunk! Drunk, soused, potted, inebriated, got it? I don't believe it. Neither do I. Perhaps it's a dream. Faulty, played by John Cleese, the tallest man never to have been in the NBA, is a nincompoop. He's conniving, he's scheming, he's cruel, and his floundering when things go wrong, his mental breakdowns, his despairing, are all funny because usually he's brought things on himself. Because he thought he could, but he couldn't. Because he deserves what he gets. But also, he's a pathetic character. I mean that in the sense that he's both sad and wretched, but also he moves us to feel for him. Faulty is rarely likeable, but in his dislikability, he still retains his humanity. And that is a critical ingredient in humour. Get back into bed! You do not seem to realise that I'm needed at the hotel! No, you're not. It's running beautifully without you. Polly cannot cope! Another example of the sad and tragic being used in comedy without that comedy necessarily having to become those things is that wonderfully shouty film, The Producers. Ah, Mrs. Bialis Stark and Bloom, I presume. <laughs> it's about two men who decide, perhaps more out of desperation than anything else, that they are going to produce the greatest flop Broadway has ever seen so that they don't need to pay back any of the investment that they fraudulently overraised and can keep it all for themselves. So you're an accountant, huh? Yes, I am. Then account for yourself! Do you believe in God? Do you believe in gold? Why are you looking up old ladies' dresses? Bit of a pervert, huh? 
Both the leads, played by Gene Wilder and Zero Mistel, are pathetic and we can laugh at them because they're such failures. Mistel's character is a previously successful, now sinking, old lady tickler. How dare you condemn me without knowing all the facts? Mr. Bialis, I'm not condemned. I'm having a rhetorical conversation. How humiliating. Max Bialystok. You see this? This one's held a pearl as big as your eye. Look at me now. Look at me now! I'm wearing a cardboard belt. Gene Wilder's character is a perpetually frightened neurotic who is easily bullied and manipulated. Step four, we open on Broadway, and before you can say step five, we close on Broadway. In his character, Leo Bloom, there's more than just incidental tragedy. What? His freakouts, his hysteria, and his rather low expectations paint a picture of a character who you find yourself feeling rather sorry for. He is a sad and seemingly lonely man, not cut out even for white-collar crime. There's no jokes exactly based on that, but that's part of his character, and part of the reason we become sympathetic to him. And that sympathy that we have, and that we might have for Basil Fawlty, is important in making the jokes deeper than the superficial, and the media, whether it be a TV show or a film, watchable for more than just the gags. Even in something fast-paced, joke-centred and utterly absurd, like Aquatine Hunger Force, there are still tragic elements, and a lot of character gags depend on them. All I gotta do when I go to the kitchen for lunch is pour it down the sink. Whatever it takes to save the earth. Cause the uh, granola girls get some more moist. <laughs> Homeless girls too. Carl, the food's unfortunate neighbour, you'll have to watch it. Trying to explain it in the rehearsal almost gave me a kidney stone. Rehearsal. LOL. Carl is a rough, no-nonsense, disgusting, sleazy dirtbag. But the jokes that don't come from those things often come from his own loneliness, isolation, and sense of own failure. Ah, screw it. Look up to Zambrano. Normally I wouldn't do a fat chick from the flag corps, but, uh... It is a new era <laughs> of loneliness. Oh, God. The tragic facet of these examples are clearly intentional, to both provide a springboard into comedy, but also to add a dimension to character. But I wouldn't call them cynical as much as just natural. Sometimes tragic moments or situations are used cynically, just as any narrative tool might be. But it isn't necessary to force, it's usually lazy to do so. After all, some of the funniest people are, in their own way, tragic figures. Figures who elicit sympathy without much more than their presence. Robin Williams is an obvious name, and I would describe him as a tragic figure even if he were alive today. Not because of anything he's done, or anything that was done to him. Not because of any experience, but because of his personality and mania. Look, Flipper! <laughs> <laughs> Right now there's a sound man going, what are you doing? <laughs> oh, God. I better relax, relax, relax. It's okay, I'm on it's TV. Right, just... You're a nice man, you won't hurt me. No, 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 no. <laughs> Hold on, let me just one sip, one sip. I'm not talking about Williams using comedy as part of his shtick. I'm talking about him, the person, not the act. Without knowing anything about Robin Williams, I think listening to him, it's easy to discover a very present sadness. And there's a voice that tells alcoholics we can drink. It's the same voice you hear if you can go up to the top of a very large building and you look over the side, there's a little voice that goes, Jump! <laughs> you can fly! <laughs> Even though your asshole's going, No, you can't! I think that a sadness was very core to Williams. I don't mean that he was sad all the time, but that you can kind of pick up from him, through his willingness to be open, that he was a haunted person. In many ways, I think Robin Williams was almost held back by his fame as a lovely and kind people's comedian. I think he was a very funny man, but personally I think his calling was as an actor, because he was so able to tap into his own mania and use it, both for tragic and comic purposes. My own personal theory is that he had very few meaty roles where the person directing wasn't so in awe of him that they could actually get the best out of him. But I also sense that sometimes, producers were so pleased that an enormously famous comedian, the most known of a generation, could actually act, they didn't push him. Heard the story of Daniel Day-Lewis breaking down on stage while playing Hamlet because he thought he saw the ghost of his own father? 
I think Williams was like that. I think he was willing to be vulnerable. That might sound like a small thing, but I think such sincere willingness is really quite a powerful tool and hard to come by. But I think I should say again that that's just a sense I have. There are, of course, other comedians who have elements of the tragic to varying degrees, such as Tony Hancock, but I think generally willingness to express those things directly or indirectly can only help in relatability. I wanted to finish off these thoughts by saying that comedy as a film genre is extremely hard to get right, possibly more than any other genre, possibly because comedy fits into a more episodic style. However, even then, I think a mistake a lot of movie producers make is to think of a comedy as having to be nothing but funny. I feel like some of Hollywood's newer comedies are so disposable that the idea of having a tragic element in there might make us relate too well with the characters, or require some writing, or something. But that's for me to shout into a brown paper bag about. So, the conclusion. Making comedy from tragedy is what we often do to deal with horrible things, to disarm worries, to mock foes. But the tragic elements in comedy, in comedy that isn't dark comedy, can, in a way, often be deeper cutting. It reflects things we all know, the mundanity of the day-to-day, -day, and the flaws behind smiles. Let's talk about the dishes. Oh, she died two weeks later. Sometimes it's intentional. Sometimes it just occurs naturally in the writing. Sometimes it's a sincere reflection of the performers. It keeps things human, and that's critical in comedy. That's the conclusion? What's the point? I hear you wail. Well, I told you at the beginning, there isn't one. Happiness, happiness, the greatest gift that I possess. I thank the Lord that I...